goes into great detail about the high priesthood of Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to just uh, flip through this next section real quick. We're not going to look at we're not going to look at it in much detail. We're going to come back to it, Lord willing, next week. The section of our text this evening is the qualifications to be high priest. We've we've already hit on a lot of that as we've gone through the text here, especially here uh, in in his divine appointment. One of the qualifications. But as we look at uh, his qualifications to be high priest, we see that according to Hebrews 5, verses 1 and 4, a high priest is divinely appointed. According to Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, a high priest is from among men, it says. Appointed from among men. Well, according to verses 5 and 6, Christ was divinely appointed to be high priest. He meets the qualification of divine appointment. And according to uh, verses 7 and 8, He was appointed from among men. Now, I want to read here uh, chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. (laughs) Because, you know, we we, we go to this verse often to... uh, show the necessity of obedience to Christ for salvation. It says that He became the author of eternal salvation to them that obey Him. But we need to also understand it in its context. We need to understand why the Holy Spirit had the Hebrews writer put that statement where it is in the text. And according to the text, it is the qualifications of Jesus Christ to be high priest. And according to the qualifications of being appointed high priest from among men, it says, beginning in verse 9, and being made perfect, that is complete, being uh, uh, made uh, qualified to be high priest, Being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. In verse 8 it says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Why did he suffer them? Why did he suffer those things? Why did he go through the, the all-night trial, the spitting and the beating and the thorns and the spear and the nails? Why did he go through all of that? So that he could be our mediator before the Father. So that he could be our high priest. He suffered and died for us. So that he could serve us. It says in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28 that he came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life a ransom. That is the purchase price to buy us out of sin. For the remission of sins. And he sits at the right hand of God. Serving us as mediator. As high priest. Having gone through the trial. The suffering. The persecutions. Of living life in the flesh. And dying For no other reason than being righteous. The world hates righteousness. That's why the Apostle Paul said that all who seek to live God in Christ Jesus will, not might or it's possible, but will suffer persecution. If we're living God in Christ Jesus, the world's going to hate us, Jesus said. He says the world hated him, it's going to hate us too. And so he suffered and died... For no other reason than that he lived a righteous life in the flesh to be our high priest. Now, when we look at what Christ did for us, we see what he suffered for us. And then we come over here to Hebrews chapter 5 and and we're told that the reason he did it all is so that he could serve us. So that he could mediate for us. So that he could sit at the right hand of God for us. How could we not give ourselves to him? How could we not willingly submit everything we have 
to one who so loves us and so perfectly provides for us eternal salvation. Unlike other high priests appointed from among men, Christ would be a priest forever. Uh, After the order of Melchizedek. Uh, There in verse 11, it says, Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. In other words, uh, now he's, he's gone through this beautiful passage exalting Christ and glorifying Christ and showing what Christ has done for us. And then... He has to end it, sadly, with a rebuke because his audience has not gone forth in their diligent study of God's word to be able to fully grasp what he's saying. He says you've become dull of hearing. I pray that none of us would allow ourselves to be dull to what Christ did for us. And to the fact that he sits forever at the right hand of God to be our high priest. In closing, let's notice that Christ lived. Christ suffered. Christ died. Taking our sins to the grave. Coming up and ascending into heaven to offer his own blood before the throne of God. For what? For what reason? For what purpose? To be our high priest. That's why he did it. And so we we have to ask this evening, is Christ your high priest? Is he your ultimate authority for everything you do? Do you submit your life to him in service to him? As Peter says in the church, if we have heard the word of God and believed what it teaches about Christ and his kingdom, and believing that we've repented of our sins, and we've confessed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and we've been baptized to have our sins washed away by his blood, then... Peter says in in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 that we are priests in the kingdom of God. And as priests in the kingdom of God, we have a high priest. Are you submitting your life to him in faithful service to your high priest? If you've not been baptized into Christ, then you don't have a high priest. You don't have a mediator before the Father. You don't have someone who will make you justified. Before the Father when judgment day comes. And he is such a faithful and merciful and compassionate high priest. How could we not want to be under his mediation? Or if having done that, you're not living in full submission to his will, in full service to him, then you too are missing out on that beautiful mediation, that beautiful uh, compassion that he has for us in our lives as we serve him as priests. If you need to repent and be restored to Christ, you'll come and receive this.